Aporia. A P O R I A. An expression of real or pretended doubt, especially for rhetorical effect. The creation of uncertainty. <laughs> it's the secret behind Christopher Nolan's Joker, and it's one of the ways how he gets things done. But before I delve into his psyche, let's take a look at some examples of Aporia. Generally, aporia is used in a speech or a debate to either guide the audience to a point or signal a dilemma, so the audience has to reflect on their position and the possible resolutions. It's a deliberate strategy that serves a useful purpose. Bill Clinton used it in a speech he gave at the Democratic National Convention in 2012. Who's right? Well, since 1961, for 52 years now, the Republicans have held the White House 28 years, the Democrats 24. As a Democrat, it is expected that Clinton will praise his party. But he created a feeling of doubt, so the audience becomes observant of what he will say next. By being skeptical about both parties, he can set his narrative and build his arguments around it. The lyrics of Bob Dylan's Blowing in the Wind also portray an aporia. The song only has rhetorical questions. How many roads must a man walk down Before you call him a man Yes, and how many seas must the white dove see Before she sleeps in the sand the point of the song is not that you can answer how many roads a man must walk down before you can call him a man. No, the point is that those specific questions are a representation of the harsh reality of the 60s and that the people can only hope for justice and a better world. While Dylan and Clinton take advantage of uncertainty in an open and honest environment, allowing the spectator to renegotiate his or her opinions, the Joker treats doubt as a potential for aggressive The Joker has an incredible grip and understanding of the human psyche, which in turn allows him to easily manipulate someone. He knows exactly what to say to get to the people he's trying to control. Inspired by Alan Moore's killing joke, Christopher and Jonathan Nolan build on the themes and philosophy of that graphic novel. All it takes is one bad day to reduce the sanest man alive to lunacy. After he created chaos in Gotham, Joker moves on to his targets. Batman and Harvey Dent. Two moments in the movie are incredibly important and vital for the Joker's plan. Let's begin with the interrogation scene. When Jim Gordon leaves the room, the light behind Joker turns on and we see Batman. He comes from the place where he has the most power, darkness. Immediately he tries to dominate Joker and he shows who he is, the vigilante with a strict moral code who is not afraid to use violence as long as it fits the laws he made for himself. Joker, not impressed with Batman's intimidation, starts talking and does not focus on the questions Batman is asking. Because Joker has a goal and answering those questions does not bring him to the goal. In the beginning of the conversation, Joker disputes Batman's morality by guilt-tripping him and saying that he is responsible for the murders Joker has committed. He is in doubt if Batman really is a good guy. Then, you let Dent take your place. Even to a guy like me, that's cold. By mistrusting Batman, Joker creates a feeling of uncertainty. With that last line, Joker disassociates himself from Batman, again pressing on the notion that Batman is not as ethical as he thinks he is. This aporia gives Joker a free pass to exploit Batman even more. He paints a narrative in which Batman is the same as the Joker, a lone wolf who stands outside of society. You're garbage, you kills for money. Don't talk like one of them, you're not. Even if you'd like to be. Batman has made a lot of effort to build a solid altruistic reputation so the police will trust him. 
although the official policy says that the police should arrest Batman, he found a way to work with them. In the interrogation scene, Joker says that Batman can try as hard as he wants, the police will never trust him. Looking at Batman's face, I think it's safe to say that he is thinking about the troubled relationship he has with Gotham Police Department and that he kind of agrees with what Joker is saying. This creates a discrepancy within Batman, because what if Joker is not only right about this, but also about other things? Batman gets a hold of himself and a bit later in the scene he tries to intimidate Joker again, yet Joker makes it absolute certain that nothing will switch. Even though Batman tries to fight the manipulation, at this point it's already too late. Within Batman, the seed of doubt is growing. The hospital scene is very similar to the interrogation scene. It starts with a violent outburst. I don't want there to be any hard feelings between us, Harvey. When you and uh, Rachel, Rachel! Rachel! The Joker is allowed to talk for a long time. The mob has plans. The cops have plans. Gordon's got plans. You know, they're schemers. And it ends with violence. You live. Uh -huh. You die. Uh, now we're talking. Here too, the Joker uses a poya to further his manipulation. The conversation begins with him dismissing his guilt in the murder of Rachel, even though it's absolutely clear that Joker is the one who made the plan. Just like the interrogation scene, Joker turns this conversation into a condemnation of the police, hoping that Batman and Harvey Dent will defy and overthrow the established social system. The Joker claims to be the innocent one in this raging world of corruption. Ultimately, he leaves Harvey with a choice to either kill him or not. In both cases, Joker would have won because the victim has faced an identity crisis. Harvey Dent is no more. Gotham's White Knight is dead. But what drove Batman and Harvey Dent to their breaking point? To answer that, you have to look at Joker's influence on their identities and the way he treats Gotham. They're only as good as the world allows them to be. I'll show you. When the chips are down, these, uh, these civilized people, they'll eat each other. The Joker creates confusion and doubt in Gotham. This is of course very obvious in the way he terrorizes this city. He creates chaos and adapts the identity of the agent of chaos. It looks like the Joker is unpredictable, but that is just what he wants us to believe. Controlling and influencing, it's a theme that runs through Nolan's trilogy. Batman Begins exploits how you lose control over your life or your mind. The Dark Knight talks about how it is to be controlled. And the Dark Knight Rises is all about reclaiming control. The Joker abuses the Chaos identity to gain more power. He is in fact in control of everything that happens. For instance, during the movie, the Joker will address several times how he doesn't have a plan. Yet the movie starts with this elaborate bank robbery scheme. Similar experiences can be found in the scene where Joker attacks the convoy that is taking Harvey Dent in protective custody only at the end when the Joker has rigged two ferries with explosives. Three examples of an incredible amount of planning. Secondly, there are the multiple stories about Joker's scars. Whenever he tells someone the origin of his scars, the stories are conflicting, and this creates more uncertainty as it seems like Joker is making stuff up, but it also allows him to stay in control. You see, those stories are a prime example of an aporia. It is completely unexpected for him to tell a story about his personal life while he holds the characters in a position where they most likely will die. By catching the characters and the audience off guard with his story, he is able to manipulate them and us as we carefully listen to what he has to say. This allows him to cover himself in mystery and we are just puppets. All of this is causing conflict with the characters and the viewers as they cannot comprehend what is real and what are lies. This fits in the image of the Joker Nolan had when he was making The Dark Knight. In an interview, Nolan had the following to say, quote, 
The purpose of the Joker for us was that he has no arc, he has no development and he doesn't learn anything through the film. He's an absolute. It's that kind of absolute force that allows the Joker to have power over his victims as they are faced with an excruciating challenge. Their whole existence as a person is in danger because the Joker is breaking down what they thought they knew about themselves. The Joker plays with their established identities. Rachel believed in what you stood for. What we stand for. Next to controlling and having power over someone, Christopher Nolan's Batman trilogy is about the search for identity and what it means to be someone. At the start of The Dark Knight, Bruce has established that Batman is who he is. And it's not a question of who he wants to be anymore. In the first scene where Bruce Wayne appears in The Dark Knight, we encounter this piece of dialogue. Know your limits, Master Wayne. Batman has no limits. Notice how Bruce answers that Batman has no limits. During the entire movie there are a total of 15 scenes where Bruce Wayne appears. Pretty much all of them revolve around him being Batman. Only two of them leave room for Bruce to be Bruce. Except that both of the scenes soon take a turn and force Batman into the picture. During the dinner scene, the conversation involves in a conversation about Batman and during the fundraiser for Harvey Dent, the Joker appears so Bruce has no other choice than to become Batman again. In contrast, Harvey Dent does not face such immense struggles as Bruce Wayne does because he is a normal person with a normal job and a quite normal life. This does not withhold him from working towards becoming an ideal person that fits his view of a perfect personality and it's in that search of who he is or who he wants to become that Harvey sometimes gets lost. We know that his nickname used to be Harvey Two-Faced. This means that Harvey was known amongst his colleagues as a seemingly good guy who can turn on you whenever things don't go his way. There's also a scene in The Dark Knight that furthers this point. I wouldn't! <laughs> you don't think I will? You don't think I will? No. No, I wouldn't. That's why I'm not gonna leave it up to me. Ed, you gotta keep your head. Tails, not so lucky. What was previously established as Gotham's White Knight does not correlate with what we see on screen. Harvey is handling the situation in an aggressive, almost violent and abusive way. This shows the complexity of Harvey's character. He wants the world to see him as a law-abiding philanthropist, but the reality is that Dent is just a normal person and he has his flaws. He cannot deal with those flaws as easily as he would like to. And this is where the Joker comes into play. With doubt as one of his many weapons of choice, he dismantles Harvey's and to an extent also Batman's identity to show everyone that the soul of Gotham can easily be corrupted with minimal effort. The organized chaos the Joker created was a smokescreen. It was nothing more than a scheme to get close to Batman and Harvey Dent. It was only necessary to implement a bit of doubt in their minds. This is how the Joker was able to manipulate both of them. This is how he succeeded.